So first we'll go for hour and a half and I will be talking about how to trace the flow of information through networks and what kind of applications, algorithms one can use for that. That will be for the first hour and a half. Um, then at 10 o'clock uh, we will have a half an hour coffee break. And then at 10.30 till uh, 12, uh, there will be a sort of a second part of the tutorial where we will go and try to understand, sort of go beyond analysis of networks where all we say is that there are no nodes and there are connections, but we will start saying about what if we start reasoning how people are friends with one another, what if we start reasoning about what is the strength of the connection, how can we predict links in social networks and so on. So this will be sort of briefly the outline of the tutorial. So we are starting with first part, it should go our for an hour and a half, um, feel free to stop me for questions um, if things are unclear and so on. Um, the other thing I should say, um, the slides for, for what I'm talking about are available at this website. Um, they are, the link is also off the tutorial web page uh, from the conference site and if you go to my, my homepage and on the top you will see sort of search for social media analytics and there is a link to the tutorial website where there are slides both to the first part and the second part. Uh, the slides for the first part I think are around 10 megabytes, so uh, be patient with the network. Okay, good, uh, thank you. So um, good morning again. So this is a tutorial on social media analytics um, and I'll be sort of start, so the first part will be about the flow of information in online networks, right? Um, so here is how, how we will start thinking about this, right? So if we think about how information reaches us, us as individuals, right? There are sort of two uh, dichotomous ways how we, how we get information. One is sort of through, let's say, personal influence of our social networks, right? Sort of we hear, we hear stuff from our friends. And the other way how information reaches us is through the transmission by, by the media, by the mainstream media through the web and so on, right? And now if I connect this to the social media, one of the definitions what social media is, it is media that is designed to, to be disseminated through social interaction, right? So what, will, what is now the sort of the, the question here is how does the information transmitted by the, by, the, by the media interact with the personal influence that is arising from our social network? Right, and the, the idea here is that sort of there is this tension between global effects, sort of something that mainstream media is pushing information on top of us, and the local effects that are coming from, the, from our social structure, right? Sort of we only hear what our friends are saying. So um, because social media is, is disseminated through social interaction, and lots of this, and social media is going on on the web, right? What this also makes a change to the web is that web is no longer a static library that people sort of passively browse, but web has become much more, right? So today, sort of, web is a place where people um, consume and create content, right? And the other thing is they also interact with one another, right? And here I sort of list a long list of different places, venues on the web where people create, um, uh, where people interact and create content, right? So these are sort of online fo discussion forums, blogs, social networks, Twitter, wikis, um, slide sharing site, bookmark sharing site, product review sites, commenting sites, and so on, right? And one, one of the important things is that since March 2010, the, the amount of, let's say, Facebook traffic is bigger than the, than the Google traffic, right? Sort of there is, there is a lot um, a lot of people or a lot of data being transmitted on or through um, the, social, the social media sites. And um, because any user can share and contribute content, express opinion and, link, and create link, links to other users, this means that sort of we can data mine opinions and behaviors of millions or billions of users to gain, to gain sort of actionable insights, right? So to gain insights into human behavior, marketing analytics, product sentiment, and so on, right? Sort of these are now the applications that, that, that we care about. Um, so here is really what, how one can think about social media analytics, right? So the idea is that we have this consumer generated content, sort of lots of it, non-edited, non-authenticated and noisy. And what we would like to get is we'd like to get some kind of actionable intelligence, right? So we'd like to get some, some useful knowledge out of that that would, that would, um, that would help us. And what I will do next is I will go through a few examples of what kind of applications or what, what can one do with these kinds of things, right? So, so sort of one, one, of, the, one of the most um, uh, 
common applications of this is reputation or brand management, management right? So you can start asking, uh -huh, what are people saying about my brand? And um, this, is, this goes under the name of consumer brand analytics. Um, similar things, you can do um, marketing communications, where basically you can, you can start asking about um, where should I spend my budget? What are people thinking about my products? How, how, what, what is the sentiment uh, with me? Who are my competitors? How do, I, how do people perceive my products and so on, right? And um, the, the last thing is, again, sort of mining product reviews. We can, we can start asking, uh -huh, what are the product features that, that people like? about my product or what are the new requests they have, right? So is my product easy to use? Is it, um, is it lightweight? Is it sturdy? Does, do, do they feel, do they get um, a good money for the buck and so on, right? So these are sort of all the things, all, all kinds of things that I can mine from the social media data, basically from these traces of human activity that is left there on the web. Um, another, another um, moving on, right? So another important uh, application here is citizen response, right? So for example, uh, for for uh, politicians or for um, uh, government officials, right? How can I sort of solicit citizen f feedback about certain, po let's say, political issues, right? So what are the issues that are being raised? What, what aspects, let's say, of a bill in Congress is popular, what is unpopular, and so on, right? So, so one, one notion here is to understand what is, what is the population thinking. And we will see some of these uh, examples later, later in the tutorial, right? Again, um, uh, there will be a very nice industrial talk um, uh, about how, how can you do data mine for political campaigns, how do, how, how do you figure out why and which people support the candidate. Um, there was a nice article in New York Times about law enforcement, sort of mining social media data to sending police um, to the crime scene before the crime happens and so on, right? So um, what imagination here can get really wild. But the idea is, right, that sort of social media in some sense is a sensor into human lives. We want to mine that to get, to get some useful um, data. Um, another application that, that is also interesting is what is called uh, real-time citizen journalism, right? Sort of the idea is that um, people that use Twitter and so on, it, it provides real-time and very valuable information about particular events, right? Um, and uh, the, the, of course, the challenge is how do I aggregate these little, little sets of tweets or these many redundant posts users have, have made um, um, to locate useful information, right? So the, the goal here would be I want to mine this real-time data to produce well-organized, let's say, summaries of events or I want to detect events and so on. Um, and of course, the, another relatively um, straightforward, sort of straightforward uh, area of application is viral marketing, right? So understanding how influence uh, spreads or recommendations, how they spread through social networks, I can start making personalized recommendations. I can go start mine online forums, um, and there have been studies that sort of show that people that that, that are users of online forums and sort of advocate brands online also advocate them offline, right? So sort of 80% of foreign contributors friend their, help their friends and uh, people online make decisions about product purchases and so on, right? So there is a lot of sort of this enthusiasm about brands and so on that people share. So by, by mining this online data, we may get some insights about this. Um, and the last sort of the last bit of thing is what we will sort of focus in the second part of the tutorial is um, how to process, let's say, social media content to provide tools to identify social networks, identify groups um, of of uh, com of. Um, in the network or identify tightly knit communities, how to connect that with, let's say, evaluations, topic, sentiment, analysis, and so on. So sort of this uh, second application, this, this, this current slide, this is what we will talk uh, after the coffee break. What I mentioned, um, uh, the applications I mentioned before will sort of be more related to the, to the uh, first part of the tutorial. So here is, here is as I said, the, the goal for the tutorial is to introduce methods for social media analytics. Um, I structured the tutorial, tutorial in two parts. First part will be how do we reason and trace and model flow of information in networks. Um, uh, the idea will be here in particular to, let's say, predict how popular or how much attention will a particular piece of information get over time. Um, we will do, um, and then maybe even like where should I place pieces of information so that they, they become popular. And then the second part of the tutorial will focus on uh, interactions and on social network structure. So the idea here will be that we want to go beyond, beyond reasoning about there is a link between a pair of nodes, people, there is no link to um, maybe start 
predicting what people think about one another, um, trying to predict outcomes without seeing what people decided to do in particular cases, and so on. Right? So um, the idea here will be to go beyond just people are connected type of reasoning. Okay? So um, as I said, um, first part, uh, three parts to it. The first one will be how do, we collect, how do we collect data and how can we sort of track the flow of information online? Uh, the second part will then be about modeling and predicting the flow of, of let's say, items, uh, information. Um, and the last part will be about how do we infer networks over which the information flows, because these networks are many times hidden or invisible. OK? So that's basically the idea. And um, I will keep going, right? So the idea is the following, right? So if I have, a, let's say, a social media platform or a site or just in general, right, um, information flows through this, right? So what I want to do is I, I want to analyze underlying mechanisms for the real-time spread of information in these online networks. And the, the questions that I'd like to in, uh, address in, in the next um, hour and 15 minutes is um, how, does, how do messages spread through social networks, how to predict the spread of these messages or information in these networks, and um, how, to how to sometimes even identify networks over which something was spreading. So um, most of the data that I will be talking about is coming from a company called Spinner, it's a small startup in San Francisco, and they're basically collecting online social media data. So today, they are getting around um, 45 million articles per day, and we've been collecting this data since August 2008, and basically what you get is pretty much everything that Google News has, that is about 20,000 news sources, plus um, I think 4 million blogs and online forums and lots of Twitter and Facebook posts. Um, why, why I'm mentioning this is because you can go to this um, URL and actually Spinner is making some data available for free to academics. You can download it. Uh, another good reference for um, social network data is the tutorial website or um, our website that is down there, so snap.stanford.edu. We are making around 60 um, large social and information networks available online for people to use. Okay, so um, we have some data that we'll be working with. Here the data is um, tens of millions of articles per day. Um, and the first question for us to understand is what are sort of the basic units of information? What are the pieces of information that propagates through these, let's call them nodes? Nodes in this site, in this case, can mean users, can mean uh, blog owners can mean, on, can mean online media sites, things like that, right? And what I'd like to do is I'd like to trace the information as it spreads, whatever, whatever I mean by that. And um, what I would really like to do is I would like to sort of track small units of small pieces of content on information that, you know, that correspond to particular events, articles, thoughts, ideas that, that uh, vary at an order of days, so that has sort of very fine, at, I would like to capture this at very fine temporal resolution, and I would, be, I would like to be able to handle this at a large scale. And what I will go through is sort of three different um, ideas or approaches how you can do something like this. So the first thing we will look at is uh, what I call cascading links to articles, right? So the idea, the idea will be that we will trace how hyperlinks are formed over time, and this will, this will be one way for us to reason how information spreads. And then I will talk about two other pieces of work where you actually don't, where you track either, um, basically you track small textual uh, fragments, to, um, how they spread or diffuse through networks, right? And um, uh, I'll, I'll talk this one, one example will be Twitter, and the other one will be um, online media. So, so the idea, what do I mean by, by flow of information? Maybe if you think about how a story gets adopted, it spreads through some underlying network as a, as a virus. So, right? so maybe there is a small, obscure technological story on some small blog, then somebody, some, some let's say, a bit bigger technological blog picks it up and maybe creates a link to it, and then you know some sort of more, um, more professional bloggers pick it up, and again, they, they link the source where they got this piece of information, and then you know the mainstream media picks it up, and so on. Right, so now I could say that the information flowed from the, my red node on the top through these blogs all the way down to the mainstream media and so on. Right, so this is what I would really like to do. I would like to somehow say, aha, uh -huh, this started here and then flowed in a particular direction. And one way to do this is to trace hyperlinks. Right, so if I make an assumption that, that a blog creates, when they create a, a link to some other blog post or some other news article, there is something useful that they decided to link at, at that article that can say that the information transmitted from here down to there and then, you know, flowed in this sort of tree-like pattern. 
So um, the, way, the way this works is the following. If I, if I assume I have a, a blogosphere or my, uh, of um, seven, seven, um, seven blogs, right? The idea is that bloggers write posts and then other bloggers write posts and link to them over time, right? And if I now trace these hyperlinks, right? So, so my, my directed edges here are hyperlinks. So a blog, uh, a blog post on this blog points to a blog post on that blog. Um, if I collect the data over time and everything is timestamped, I can trace the hyperlinks in the reverse direction and I can from this extract the flow of information um, uh, through, through this underlying network, right? And there may be maybe another blue piece of information that spreads in some other different way, right? So, um, the, um, what the, so this is one way of looking at this. The other way of looking at this is the following, right? So the way what I'm trying to show here is every square is, is a media site, let's call them blogs, right? And every circle is a post, right? And these posts link to one another. So if I collect this kind of data, then I have blogs, I have posts or articles on these blogs. Um, my edges represent hyperlinks, right? And I, I, because everything is timestamped, I know how these hyperlinks were created over time. I can now sort of do a breather search from the roots, so pages that have no outlinks, and follow information back the way it's spread, right? And what this kind of, um, 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 a graph that, or a tree or whatever, a chain over that, um, that is basically like um, a trace of how information spread through the network, I will call this a cascade, right? So cascade is a graph induced uh, by time ordered propagation of information, right? And now I can start studying how do these cascades look like, how does the sentiment change as the information propagates step by step and so on. So um, let me show you some, some examples of this thing. So, um, here is, here is the first thing you can do. You can go and, and just enumerate or count these shapes of the cascade. So what kind of uh, structure do these graphs have? And what I'm showing you here is um, a, a, a piece of analysis where we took 10 million blog posts, we identified 350,000 different cascades, and then we counted how often does the sort of each, how often does each pattern occur, right? And what I'm showing here is I'm showing the patterns and I'm sorting them um, in the decreasing order, right? So um, what is, what is the observation? Of course, small cascades are more uh, frequent than the big ones. Um, another thing that is interesting is that most of these cascades are very, are very bushy, are very sort of wide, right? They are basically stars, or they are these very shallow, very wide, um, very wide trees. But then from time to time, you have a sort of more interesting um, sh um, structures of how information propagated, right? So the idea here is that the, uh, the information starts on top and then fr flows from top to bottom where the directions of the edges are the directions of the underlying hyperlinks where sort of a child points up um, to the parent. Um, another interesting thing one can do is actually one can now start tracing how does the sentiment change as the information uh, propagates, right? So the idea here is that, again, every node here is a, is a blog post. Um, uh, edges in this graph represent hyperlinks. So now I have the flow of information from top to bottom, and I can start... Uh, um, I can do sentiment analysis on the on each of these blog posts, and I can start asking how does the sentiment change if I like you know does do, do opinions get polarized and so on. So the way the way um, the way this was done was that for basically for each blog, so each of these posts corresponds to a blog. So for each blog, we will compute like the baseline sentiment. So that would be like a baseline sentiment score for all the blogs blog posts that were published in that uh, in that blog. And then for for a particular post, let's say this one for that particular blog, we will say okay, what's the deviation from the baseline? Of that um, of that blogger, right? And the, the the things that we will reason about is something we will call uh, subjectivity, which is just the absolute deviation in sentiment from the baseline sentiment of that blogger. And then we we can talk about positivity and negativity. Positivity is sort of positive deviation from the from the baseline, sort of being more positive than usual. Negativity is deviation in the other side, right? And the question, for example, is how does the sentiment flow, or does it flow at all when when information transmits from top uh, towards the bottom? And here are sort of two kind of interesting results. So the first question you can start asking, uh -huh, if the parent gets more subjective, what, what, is the, what is the effect on the child, right? So what I mean by that is, this is the parent, that's the child, right? So a parent chooses some language. If he chooses his baseline sentiment language, then the child, the person who cites the information, will also have um, close to the baseline sentiment. But if the parent is very, let's say, positive or negative, also the child will get influenced and he will deviate in the same direction, right? So what this seems to say is that 
if the, if the source of information is subjective, then the parent will also get sub subjective, right? So there is correlation or there is some kind of influence that propagates through as the information also propagates. Another, so this is sort of the first, the first point, is that there is correlation in sentiment between uh, uh, parents and children. The other interesting plot is this one. So this one plots, on the x-axis, it plots sort of the levels of the cascade, right? So this cascade here has four levels, right? There's one, two, three, four, right? And what I'm plotting here is sort of, as the information gets farther away from the source, I'm, I'm plotting the, um, for example, with the black line, here is um, objectivity, right? And what this is trying to say is that cascades sort of some, usually they start with relatively um, um, mild, sort of without any, sort of they start with the baseline sentiment and then very quickly the opinions polarize, right? So there is, there is this um, increase in, in um, or decrease in objectivity, which means uh, people start using sen sentiment, sentiment words more and more, and then, and then the cascade cools off and sort of gets more objective. So what this seems to suggest is that in the first few steps of information propagation, there is this, um, let's say, polarization that occurs, and then as information gets older and propagates even further, um, um, uh, the, the opinions start to cool off, and actually the language gets uh, more objective than what was the baseline of the of the, of, the, of the bloggers that, that are mentioning the things, right? So it's interesting that you get this sort of um, quick spike or this uh, quick heating up of the cascade and then sort of cooling off effects as the information gets uh, further out. Um, these are just two examples what can be done with information flow and sentiment. I think there are like tons of other interesting questions here that, 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 that haven't yet been answered. But the, uh, the way, the, the enabling thing here is to trace, have blog, uh, blog posts, trace hyperlinks so that we can see how inf the pattern in which information flows and now start analyzing the sentiment as a function of the shape of the cascade or the distance from the initiator of the cascade and so on. So um, this, is, uh, this is the first way how we can trace information, through hyperlinks. Um, what is, so what is good about, sort of if I try to abstract up and say what is good about this and what is not so good about this? So, yeah? So the spike that you're mentioning, the first one, mm -hmm. is the main reason because the closer a particular child node is to the source of the post, uh, the correlation is higher as you go down the line. Exactly, the correla correlation gets, gets, so exactly, so here is the, the, the correlation is positive and sort of the slope is more than one. So here it seems that if the parent is subjective, children are getting even more subjective, right? But then when you go high off, sort of the correlation seems to turn around and it says children get less subjective than the parent. Okay, cool. So to say, to say some thoughts about this, right? So the first thing is why, is, why is tracing hyperlinks good? First, the thing is, the first thing is, it's very, it's unambiguous, precise, and explicit way to trace information, uh, to trace information flow, right? I, we obtain uh, both the time when information reads someone, and we also obtain the trace of the information. So we obtain the graph, we obtain the cascade. So we can start analyzing these cascades. Um, what is not so good about this is that basically we are making this assumption that whenever someone creates a link to somewhere, else, there was some information from there that transferred to me, right? So there are many links that do not transmit information, in particular navigational links, templates, and things like that. The other important point is that, for example, mainstream media sites do not create links to one another, right? So there are no links between Washington Post and New York Times, even though they may be stealing stories from one another, right? So um, the problem is, um, that sort of this data is very, let's say, um, very high, uh, high precision but low recall, right? Similar happens with bloggers who sort of forget to add a link to the source, right? Um, and this, this, this problem that people don't create hyperlinks or that we often in online media have net, sort of have these implicit networks will motivate um, the, uh, the later part of the, uh, of the tutorial where we're asking can we infer the networks over which the information spreads, okay? So this is, this is the one important point. The other important point that, that I want to more uh, skim through than go into details is really that basically because we have incomplete data um, when we collect this information flow, especially if you go online on the blogosphere, the, the problem becomes that our cascades will become funny. So what I mean by that is imagine that this is, this is a particular cascade, right? It's just a tree of how information spread. It started at the red node and then it, it touched all these nodes. So, but then the problem is because I'm crawling uh, online data, maybe I didn't crawl or somehow I missed the, the blog posts that, uh, that here I show in gray, right? So the, the problem is that 
uh, my data, I have missing data. So instead of my cascade being this kind of nice uh, binary tree, or near, a nearly binary tree, it will really be some, some strange thing. It will be like a chain here and then sort of two more separated components and so on, right? So the, the important thing here is if I, let's say, have some network and I have something propagating through the network, some cascade, uh, this uh, chain of uh, land two, right? And then uh, for some reason, maybe I didn't crawl or somehow I'm missing data that node R also mentioned this piece of information. Then my cascade, instead of looking like this as it should, it will look like just, just as two isolated nodes. And if I now start asking, okay, what are the properties of this thing versus the properties of that thing? Of course, it's very different, right? So here I can say, what is the, the depth or one plus the depth of this cascade? Here I'll say three, here I'll say, uh, here I'll say um, uh, sorry. What is the size? Here I'll say three, right? I have three nodes. Here I'll say I have two nodes. Or if I start asking what is the depth of the cascade, here I'll say the depth is two. Here I'll say depth is zero, right? So the one problem is if I have a few missing pieces in the, in the trace of information flow in the cascade, my cascade can get disconnected um, and I have no clue how, what to, to do about it. Um, so um, here is, here is um, what, what one can do. Actually, that it is possible to correct for the effects of missing data in cascades, right? So the way you can think about this is to say, okay, I want to, to, to find some properties of the complete cascade C. And property can mean what is the depth, what is the number of nodes, what is the number of leaf nodes, and things like that, right? So that's what I'd like to do. The problem is that I have missing data. So I don't get to see this real cascade, but I just get to see some kind of cascade with missing nodes. Right, and um, if um, under the assumption that each node is missing uniformly at random with some small probability, th we have sort of we have a paper, or there is a paper th wh whose main message is the following. The first thing is that the the method that we that we put in the paper um, is becomes very effective when about when more than 20% of the data is missing, and you can reconstruct cascades when you have even around 90% of the missing data. So the idea is that even though you went online and collected incomplete data, you can use some kind of model-based techniques to actually um, connect disconnected pieces of cascades and really reason about how the complete data would look like. Um, it's just something to have in mind uh, when you do these kinds of analysis. Okay, so this was the first way to trace information, tracing hyperlinks. A second way of tracing information, which, which is very popular lately, is to use Twitter, right? So you, Twitter is an information network. Each user generates a stream of tweets of sort of 140 character long messages, and then also t users can subscribe to follow streams of other users. And there are sort of three ways how to track information flow um, in Twitter. So the first way is to trace the spread of what is called hashtags. I'll explain what hashtags are. The second, the, the next thing is similar to hashtags is particular URLs. And the last option is sort of this explicit way how people can forward interesting pieces of information through the mechanism called the retweets that I will also describe. So the first, um, what do I mean by hashtags, right? So here is um, 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 about, so I was preparing these slides. Um, I, I sort of focused on, the, on the, um, the, the crisis or the revolution in Egypt, right? And the things about Mubarak, right? Uh, their president, right? So the idea is that when people uh, tweet about something, they can put this hashtag in front of a particular keyword and this now becomes like a tag for that, uh, for that, for that, uh, for that person or something, right? So somebody here used two hashtags. One is hash Obama and the other one is hash Mubarak, right? So many times um, um, these hashtags mean particular people. Sometimes they are very sort of culturally specific. So for example, uh, the, one of the most popular um, uh, hashtags in uh, uh, January 2011 was uh, you need a new boyfriend, right? And the idea was that sort of people would exchange these sort of stories about their, their ex-boyfriends and they would tag these kind of stories with a you need a boy, new boyfriend type of hashtag. Or there was another one that was called hip hop groceries, right? And this was sort of this joke that instead of having a grocery list of things, of items you need to buy in a store, you would have a list of uh, hip hop artists. And again, right, so we have this hashtag called hip hop groceries that people would um, put next to next to their uh, tweets, right? So these hashtags, what is really about them is that they emerge naturally from inside the network, so now you can trace how they spread through the network, right? So the idea, the way you can do this is to say, aha, uh -huh, because I have the underlying network who follows whom, and if I make the assumption that hashtags only emerge through uh, inside the network, then I can trace 
uh, how information spread, right? So, so if uh, B follows A and A mentions uh, hashtag, let's say, Mubarak today, and B will mention it tomorrow, and because B follows A, I could make this assumption that this information about Mubarak spread from A to, uh, to node B. So that is um, the first way how we can do things. The second way, very similar, is we can trace URLs, right? So many times, um, tweets contain URLs to interesting articles that people want to talk about, right? So here is an example of a, of a tweet that has a particular shortened URL in it, right? So, so now what we can do, again, we can use the same thing. We, we trace the appearances of these URLs uh, uh, in the tweets. And this way, we can start making assumptions and starting to see how, how this usage of these uh, URLs flows uh, through the network. Um, one important thing with Twitter URLs is that these URLs are hashed. They are shortened. So there are these uh, services like um, Twitter has its own one. There is Bitly that is popular where you put in a long URL, and it will give you a very short uh, URL. And many times, these short URLs are actually the hashed versions of URLs are personalized. So if I hash a URL, I'll get a different hash code than if you hash the URL. So can really then attribute who was the person that was spreading that URL through the network. And sometimes, of course, um, that can also not be the case. Okay, so these are two things, and people have done a lot of studies about how information diffuses through Twitter through by studying adoption of hashtags or studying adoption of um, URLs. Um, and the second thing that is explicit about tracing information in Twitter is, is a mechanism called retweets, right? So the idea here is um, that um, this is sort of an explicit information diffusion mechanism on Twitter. So if node B sees a tweet from A, it can forward it to its followers, right? So if A creates a tweet, B sees it in his, let's say, new stream of tweets, they can, uh, B can sort of press a button and say, oh, this is an interesting tweet, I want, to, uh, I want to include it as a part of my stream so that my followers get to see it, right? So these are followers of B. Um, and uh, the way you see this is here's an example of a, of a tweet where here it says, aha, uh -huh, this was retweeted by someone, right? So this was sort of the original person who, who wrote this and now somebody retweeted uh, that tweet. And again, we can spread this, this way how really tweets propagate, um, propagate through networks. Um, here, right, so if people follow people up, the information spreads from top to bottom. Um, now, now, these were sort of two, two things two things how, how we, can, we can work with um, content on Twitter. What is nice about Twitter is that we have who follows whom network, and we have relatively sort of easy keywords or sort of pieces of text that we can trace, meaning hashtags and URLs, and see how information spreads. Um, the, the, sec the, the third way how we can trace information online is through what, what we call uh, meme tracking, right? So memes are, you know, sort of short textual signatures, um, fragments that travel relatively unchanged through many articles. And the way, the, way the, the case study that I will be talking about here is basically is really saying, let's look at the text that ap appears inside quotation marks, right? So there's a quotation mark, some te text, end of quotation mark. Um, and the interesting thing is that about, if you take this um, spinner data, which means online media data and um, blogs, um, you get about one, 1.25 uh, quotes per document in the data, right? And the quotes are very interesting because uh, people tend to use them quite a lot. They, they follow iterations of a story as the story evolves. And the other thing that's nice about quotes, it's, it's very clear um, who said it, when they said it, and where they said it, right? So it's very easy to attribute quotes to people. It's much easier to attribute quotes to people than some, or to events than to attribute some kind of keywords to events and try to reason back saying, aha, uh -huh, now I have these three keywords going up, what happened? Here, I have the quote, I know where that happened. It's very easy to trace those things. So the first problem if I now trace quotes or particular subparts of text is that um, these things uh, mutate quite a lot. So what I'm showing you here is, this is, this is now um, um, about two years old. This is from the, from the 2008 US presidential campaign um, just before the election, sort of this was Obama versus Bush uh, election um, three years ago in November 2008, where I have a particular, oh, uh, a particular um, uh, quote. Here, this is from Sarah Palin talking about um, uh, Obama uh, uh, paling around with terrorists, right? And what I'm showing you here is all different mutational variants of this particular long quote or long statement from Sarah Palin. And the, the edges of this graph show some kind of approximate inclusion relationships. So the way you can think about this is the sort of uh, information, the, the more complete, longer pieces of information are at the bottom, and then shorter, piece, shorter pieces of information sort of mutated or were extracted from these longer pieces. 
right? So this, is, this, sh this shows you all different mutational variants of a, of a particular longer quote, right? And you can see that, you know, sometimes people misspell, misspell they change, they change the, the tense, um, they take a particular subpart of the longer quote, and so on, right? So the first task, if we want to uh, extract information um, uh, this way, is to, is to, um, is to, is, to, is, to, is to identify these uh, mutational variants. And one way to, to, to uh, find these mutational variants of a, of a piece of information or a quote or a sort of a short sentence is, that, uh, is to form what we will call an approximate quote inclusion graph, right? So where the idea is that I take a shorter quote and I try to approx and, and I do sort of approximate substring matching into a longer quote, right? So the idea is sort of to say, if, if I'm a particular quote, who, who could my parents be, right? And um, for example, here, a, a, B, C could have evolved from A, B, C, D, or it could evolve from A, B, X, C, E, right? And um, if I would want, if A, B, C would evolve from here, there would be lots of mutation going on, right? The edit distance is longer, while here the edit distance is, is very short, right? I just need to delete D, and I get A, B, C. Right? So the way we will do this is every node will be, will be the quote. Edges are some kind of um, approximate inclusions, inclusion relationships, and edges also have weights, which means that um, it means, let's say, how likely, um, how likely um, a particular quote has evolved from, from its set of parents. Right? And what we would like to do this in this, this the, the, the way we constructed the graph is, um, ensures that the graph will be um, a, um, a directed acyclic graph of approximate quote inclusions. We want, we want to delete the minimal total edge weight such that each component has a, has a single sync node, right? So let me show you what I mean by that and then I'll explain why this makes sense. So in this particular example, I would delete these particular edges and that would be my solution, right? So I would have these connected components that all, all end up in a single sync node, right? So I could say that this is sort of the mother quote, the mother phrase from, from which everything else has evolved, right? And this way, I can now identify different mutational variants of a single phrase, right? So what I was showing you on the previous slide was really a graph like this, right? I was showing you different variants and how they include in one another for the pelling around with terrorists phrase, right? Um, of course, the question is, how do I do this kind of partitioning? As, as, as pretty much, or as many kinds of partitioning are, this DAG partitioning is also MP-hard but there are some very effective heuristics. Um, the, the observation that lets you design these heuristics is that, that basically the idea is that it's enough to know node's parent to, to reconstruct the optimal solution, right? So if, I, so if at every node I pick the, the, the true parent from where the node evolved, I can reconstruct the optimal solution. So the way, the way the, our heuristic works is we start at the top and we, we then, we then uh, proceed in sort of topological order of this DAG and at every, at every step we ask nodes who, who is, who, where do you think you, you, you have most likely evolved from? And there we also include the size of the, of the cluster and the, the parent um, that the node belongs to and this way we sort of can extract this kind of trees that, that approximate these um, inclusion relationships and give us different um, mutational variants of the same piece of content. Um, what is interesting here is that without any sum human supervision, now we identified short pieces of content, we identified how, we, how these pieces of content mutate, and now we can start looking at them. And sort of this is, this is the plot, again, before the 2008 US presidential election of where x axis is time and y axis is number of mentions per hour, right? And what is nice is that you get now, you get to see a very nice description of what was media talking about in this um, um, three months before the presidential election, right? You have sort of this first spike here is the, uh, the uh, Republican convention, oh sorry, Democratic convention, this was a Republican convention, this was the famous lipstick on a pig uh, um, uh, quote, um, there, is, um, there was then sort of the, the statement that fundamentals of US or our economy are strong and then a week later they realize that it's the opposite so that the entire economy is in danger and so on and so forth, right? And um, this way you, you can basically just, just by doing this you can get very nice insights into what, were, what was the online media and the blogosphere talking about. Another thing that you can do is actually now you can like rank uh, sites by how, how quickly do they tend to mention information. And um, in particular, what I'm showing you here, I'm having grank, lag, which means negative lag, lag in hours means that this website tends, tends to mention news before they reach peak popularity. So zero is peak popularity, and then negative means you are, the website is before the peak, 
And what you start seeing here, for example, is that um, professional blogs tend to mention information much, much sooner before it becomes uh, most popular. And then these are the mainstream media sites. They are still sooner, but uh, they, they are still quick, but they appear after the professional bloggers, right? And of course, now you can go and select um, subparts of these quotes or quotes on a particular topic to do finer, finer resolution analysis. So um, here, is, here is an ex uh, example of how you can do finer, finer resolution analysis with this, kind of, uh, with this kind of approach. So this was something that we did together with the um, uh, Pew Foundation's project on ex excellence in journalism, right? And they really wanted to understand the, the media coverage of the current economic crisis, right? And then they, they tried to see what were the main statements or the main phrases that, that, that got the most attention on the web, uh, who, who mentioned those phrases and so on, right? And here is, here is, um, here is an example from their, from their re report that we helped them create, right? So this was um, for early 2009. These are different fra phrases all about the economic crisis. This is who was the person that, that said them, when they said them, and this was the number of mentions in our, um, in our uh, data set. And what is interesting to see here is that basically um, it was the, the person who got the most attention on this particular issue was actually Barack Obama, right? And then, you know, um, the, 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 the Ted Bernanke, the, the chief of uh, Federal Reserve Bank, he was only here uh, towards the bottom. Uh, the, the top Republican voice was ranked only number 14 in, on this particular issue. Um, the, the thing that was ranked number five was this um, cartoon from New York Post where sort of the two policemen shoot the monkey and then they say, we need to find someone else to write the next stimulus bill. So this was sort of very controversial. They had to pull it off. But again, it got like super lots of attention and so on, right? So this, so what is my point here? My point here is that through analysis of, let's say, things that appear in quotes, and then you can also go outside quotes and doing some fine-grained analysis. You can rank media sites by how quickly they mention particular pieces of information. You can choose quotes or phrases on a particular topic and start, start to try to understand what issues or who are the main proponents of the debate and so on. So this is, um, this is what I wanted to say about how to trace the flow of information. And um, there are, of course, many other ways to, to trace flows. For example, you can use uh, internet email chain letters. This was done by Lieber Novell and John Kleinberg uh, to trace how information spreads between people. You can, for example, use classifiers to predict wh what was the information flow. So this was used by um, Alada Damich and Eitan Adar back in 2005. Uh, 2005. There is, for example, you can similar ways of what you can do with Twitter. You can also um, do with face on, on the Facebook wall and trace uh, how information spreads there. Um, you can spread the diffusion of favoriting a particular photo on Twitter, uh, product recommendations, and so on. So there are many different cases online where it's relatively easy to trace how information spreads. Um, so this is this sort of finishes my first part of the talk. And now I'll keep moving on and start saying, uh -huh, now we were able to trace the flow. What useful things can we do with this? And so far, sort of, I was more focusing on what kind of insights can we get. Now I sort of want to get more, more algorithmic and more, more into applications. So here is the first thing that maybe we'd like to understand, right? We'd like to understand how does, informa how does information attention arise and decay over time, right? So we would sort of try to understand what are typical classes of uh, popularity curves of online information, right? So the, the terminology for the next part is that I will call item and I will make, I will use a word item to refer to a particular piece of information. This could be a quote, it could be a hashtag on Twitter or something like that, right? And then I will use the expression saying volume of the item, which is just the number of mentions of that item over time, right? So how many people mentioned a particular URL on Twitter? Or how many people mentioned, how many bloggers mentioned a particular quote? At, during particular time interval, right? And what? And now this naturally gives me a time series, right? For every piece of content, I have a time series. X axis is time. Y axis is popularity of the time series. And what I would like to do first is to say, okay, what are the typical shapes of these kind of curves that that or, that that occur online, right? So the idea is the following, right? I'm given a volume of an item over time, right? So number of mentions of a quote over time, and I want to discover what types of shapes do this volume time series have, right? So imagine that I have four pieces of content. This is time, this is number of mentions. Um, and what I would like to do is I would like to cluster these pieces of content together and say, aha, uh -huh, this is the first type of shape, two, two spikes, and this is the second type of shape, one spike asymmetric. Maybe this is the insight I'd like to get, to get. okay? So the idea is really I want to do time series clustering. 
Um, the only, the only sort of the interesting thing here is that I, the, the distance function between the time series that I want to use will be a bit funny. So the first, the first one will be that I want my time series to be invariant to scaling, right? So if I have two time series and they only differ in how high the y-axis, I would like the distance between them to be zero because I'm really interested in shapes. And then the second thing is I would like my time series to be invariant to translation, to time, right? So if I have something happened one month ago and something happening today, but they follow the same popularity trend, again, I would like the distance between, between these two trends to be zero. Um, so really my distance measure um, between or metric between two uh, time series X and Y is, um, is, is the Euclidean distance where I want to scale and translate. So A is the scaling factor, of, right? And um, Q is the translation. I want to translate the, the scale and translate the second time series to become the most similar to my, to my original one. And then I measure the distance between the two. Um, what is interesting, because this is non-Euclidean distance metric, um, if I want to do clustering, I have to develop special clustering algorithm to be able to do this. And um, you can do that, sort of, you can then now run k-means with this particular um, distance metric to find, uh, to find different clusters. And sort of what you realize is that there are six, six different shapes or patterns of attention or popularity that online information gets. So this is, this is now, these are now the six clusters for the, for the quote, quoted phrases. Um, here they are. I should note that you find the same six types of shapes if you do, if you cluster, uh, if you follow information on Twitter, if you take, let's say, 600 million uh, tweets and around 8 million hashtags. And then uh, later as a follow-up, um, a work that was trying to cluster query popularity and say what are the shapes of query popularity online uh, found the same types of shapes. So let me tell you what these shapes are, right? So what do I have is on the top I have three different um, sort of single spike-like patterns, right? So again, uh, x-axis is time, y-axis is, uh, think of it as the number of mentions um, over time. Um, the, nu the numbers don't matter, numbers here are hours. Um, you see sort of one, um, we would call this like an average pattern. This is like a very quick spike and this is like a quick asymmetric spike. And then you have sort of patterns that go longer. You have a big spike and a small one, a small one and a big one and sort of something that has one spike but then relatively slow decay. And the other thing that I'm showing here is also we, we labeled different websites because this is for quoted phrases, for memes, um, depending on their type. So we have, we, se we separate out newspapers, professional blogs, TV, TV stations, news agencies, and personal blogs, so normal blogs. And what I'm showing here with these letters and these squares is when, when do particular media type tend to mention particular phrases? And what is interesting is that um, um, the, the shape of the popularity so it seems to be, it correlates really well with when do particular media sites um, uh, participate in the discussion, right? So if I have something that reaches popularity quick, very quickly and then sort of dies off, then these kind of phrases are indicative of phrases that were first mentioned by news agencies and then uh, newspapers, professional blogs, TV stations, and then blogs, uh, the normal bloggers, right? So I get this very quick spike, quick decay, um, the, the point here is that blogs tend to mention these kind of phrases 1.2 hours later than the mainstream media, and they only, let's say, contribute 29% of the volume. This is a different cluster that I had from the previous slide. Here you can see the order of different media sites is it's very different. It's actually the bloggers, the personal bloggers, who tend to mention phrases that, that have this type of popularity curve first. And then it's followed by the mainstream media. You see that here they, um, they, they mention um, news about 20 minutes before the mainstream media does, and blogs also contribute uh, most of the volume, right? So, so what is the point that I want to make here is that basically different times, types of media give rise to characteristic popularity or, or volume patterns, right? So the, 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 the thing is that depending on when a particular type of media participates in the, let's say, discussion or mentions a particular phrase, this will have a char char characteristic, um, this will give rise to a characteristic um, shape of popularity of this thing over time. Okay, so that is, um, that is uh, why, uh, why uh, sort of the finding here. And the way why this is important is because what I really want to do is I want to do the following, right? I would like to build a model that will predict how much information, how much attention will a piece of information get, right? So basically what I will be doing, I will be sort of doing like a time series prediction problem, right? I have a time here, I have number of mentions of, of a particular quote, 
uh, over time. And what I'd like to do, I see it till, till present. I would like to predict what will happen with this in the future. Okay, so that's that's the goal. We are trying to predict now what will be the what will be the popularity of a particular um, piece of content in the in the future. And the way how people usually thought about this was to say, aha, uh -huh, I have some underlying network, I have something spreading over the edges of this network, and now if I am able to model this process well, then I should just count how many new, new nodes get infected at every time step, and this, should, this would be my prediction, right? The problem is that many times the network is unknown, and the second problem is that you have very sparse data. So it's very hard to very accurately model this kind of, this kind of spreading process. So the way, the way we will do this here is we will say that we want to predict the future number of mentions of a particular piece of information based on who mentioned it in the past, right? So we will say, we, we will predict the future based on who mentioned the thing in the past, right? And this is exactly the intuition we built um, five slides ago where we said, depending on which media sites mention information when, this will give you a particular popularity or volume uh, series over time. So here we want to say, based on who mentioned it, we want to predict what will happen in the future. Um, so I want to still predict how much attention information will get. And the way I can think about this, for example, like uh, in a caricature way is, you know, I can say, uh -huh, who reports information and when? And maybe imagine that this is now some, some piece of story about something leaking, maybe iPhone 5 leaking out or something, right? So I would imagine that in the first hour after the story breaks out, it would be like uh, professional blogs, professional technological blogs who would mention this. And maybe, you know, an hour later, it would be news agencies. And even an hour later, it would be, um, big news media sites, maybe newspapers, TV stations, and so on, right? And now I would like to predict how many other sites will mention this information in hour four, hour five, and so on. And um, really, the way we will approach thinking about this is, is uh, ask the following question. We will try to model uh, the, the, the following thing. We will say, if, let's say, New York Times or, or uh, some other particular media site mentions information at particular time t, how many additional mentions does this generate uh, at time t plus one, t plus two, t plus three, right? So what I'd really like to do is sort of measure what is the, in some sense, influence or um, of, of New York Times on the number of mentions after New York Times mentions a piece, of, a piece of content. So the idea would almost be trying to say, if I get New York Times say something, how much popularity does this buy me one hour later, two hours later, and so on, okay? So that's what we would like to do. And, um, the way we will do this is basically we will say, aha, uh -huh, because now I know uh, for every website how much additional popularity it generates some number of times after it mentions the thing, we will predict the volume, so the popularity of the item uh, based on uh, which sites mentioned it in the past. We will formalize this into something that I will call linear influence model. Uh, the benefits here will be that we don't need any underlying network. Um, and that basically we will be able to model the global influence of each node on the adoption of particular uh, content, and we will be able to model this over time, and, um, and then we'll be also able to make predictions. Um, so uh, the good points here are that no knowledge of the network is given, and sort of um, the data sparsity does not kill us. Um, so here is how we will think about this, right? So imagine that I have just one piece of content that I'm tracing. I will call it con item or contagion, right? And all I get to know is the number of um, uh, V is the volume, so it's number of new uh, sites that mention this piece of content at time t, and M is the set is the set of these websites that mention the thing. So the way the, I, the way I can think about my data is something like this, right? I have time, I have um, uh, identities of websites that mentioned the, the particular phrase and I get, I know their count, right? And what I would like to do now is I would like to predict what would be, let's say, the volume. I would like to predict this number in the future time, right? So I don't want to predict the identities. I just want to predict the overall popularity of um, this uh, one, one item. Right, and the way I will do this is the following. I will assume that each node, each media site has a, what we will call an influence function. So this influence function, just think of it as some kind of, um, it's not really sort of influence in causal sense, it's just um, something that is well correlated with total volume, right? So and this influence function will model the thing where we will say, after the node U gets infected, after node U mentions the information, how many other sites Tend to, tend to mention information one hour later, two hours later, and so on, right? And then we will use 
um, historical data to, to estimate these influence functions, and then we will be able to make predictions about what will happen in the future. So the way, the way we will think about this is the following, right? So we will say, I have this influence function, and the, the shape of the influence function would be something like this. It says, right, after, I get, after node u gets infected, in the first hour it generates this many uh, mentions, an hour later even more, and then sort of its influence decays over time. Right, so the way I could say what is the influence function of CNN, it would sort of say how many other sites say, say, tend to mention the information after they see it on CNN. Right, so this is what I would really like to model here in some sense. Um, right, and then because I'm doing it this way, it's also very easy to make predictions. It's just saying I will, uh, I will predict the future volume, the future popularity using the influences of the nodes that got infected in the past. Um, so um, here, is, here is how my model will, will work, and I think it sort of will become clear um, how, how, how we can make predictions, right? So I have some um, time series, a particular piece of content, time versus number of mentions over time, and I would like to predict what will happen in some future time. Um, and imagine that I also know um, the times when three particular media sites, U, V, and W, mentioned this particular piece of information. And because for each of them I also have their influence function, right? So here is the influence functions of the first one of the site U, and it starts when you mention the information, and then I have the one of the V, and I have the one of the W. The, the way I can predict the volume in the future is to just take the, 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 the influence, the values of the influence functions at, at this point in the future when I want to make the prediction, sum them, sum them up, and that is my prediction, right? So really what I will be trying to do is I will say, okay, how can I estimate these shapes so that whenever I want to predict the volume in the future, these this, um, this shapes of these influence functions will add up to the, to the value in the future, right? So um, really, um, that, is, that is the thing that I want to do. And as I said, my prediction about the popularity of, a, of an item in the future will simply be the, will simply be the sum of appropriately aligned um, influence functions, right? And the, what I mean by the aligned, because different sites mention information at different points in time, the influence function starts at the time when the site mentions the information. And if you mention it, let's say, multiple times, of course, you get multiple influence functions put together and so on, okay? So now the question is, how, do, how can I figure out the shape of these influence functions. So the way we will do this is, is the following, right? So um, as, as I said, right, these influence functions are not observable. We need to estimate them. The way we will think about, we will do this is we will make no assumption about the shape of this. We will do this in a non-parametric way. So really what we will do is we will, we, will, we will say, we will put together some kind of error term, try to optimize it, and discover what the shapes of influence functions are. So the way this will go is we will assume that influence functions are just a set of numbers, let's say 24 numbers, right? So every influence gets to zero after 24 hours, so I can measure the, sh um, characterize the shape of the influence function by, by a set of 24, uh, 24 numbers, right? So the value is here, and I truncate it, let's say, at 24. And then what I really want to do is I want to find the, the sh the sh the, these 24 numbers for each website such that the following expression is minimized, right? So here is the, the, here is the, the for a particular piece of information and for a particular time, this is the true number of mentions of that piece of information in the future, and this is my estimate, right? It's the sum over the websites that mentioned information in the past, and it's the sum of their influences, right? So now I can ask, how should I, how should I set these values i such that this, this summation um, this error term is as small as possible. And sort of what is the point is that the point is that this looks like a least squares problem. And it really boils down to a least squares problem, right? So at the end, I'm doing nothing else than a bit um, interesting least squares. To show you how I can put everything together to solve a big uh, least squares problem, the idea is the following now. So instead of working with one contagion, one piece of information, I work with k pieces of information. So each I will, comp and I will now compose these things into a big matrix, a uh, column vector and another column vector. So this column vector I will call V, and these are sort of just stacked together volume time series of each of my K different pieces of information. And then um, I are the influence functions that I want to estimate, and then this matrix here is, is sort of, play it's a, some kind of indicator matrix, which sort of says who are the websites particular piece of information in the past, right? So sort of, um, I will set um, this, an element of this matrix to one if node gets infected by, by a particular piece of information k at time t. 
um, for each of these pieces. So this is a simple binary matrix that sort of says, uh -huh, the volume in the future is a sum of particular influences of particular websites. And now I can go, go solve this matrix equation um, to figure out what the influences are. This is something that is called non-negative least squares. There are super effective methods to do this. So for example, if you have a matrix of 200,000 times 4,000, 4, um, you can do this in less than a second. And also then how we make predictions is we just add influences together and we have, uh, we have the prediction. So here, is, here are some results. So the setting that I will, uh, yeah? Uh, can you go to the yeah, um, so over here you're taking the, uh, the influence function you're learning on each. No, 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 I'm doing everything together here. So the idea is, this is, these are, this is the volume of a particular piece of information. So I have k pieces of information. Here I have um, influence functions for each website. So the question is, uh, this is some kind of indicator matrix. Um, I want to figure out this so that, so that uh, after I multiply this matrix with this vector, I get this time series as close as possible. So really my optimization problem is this V, volume, and here is my prediction. But I think my question is more like for the each influence function you're learning individually on each media site, right? Exactly. How many behavior of that if you're trying to learn over the 24 hour period? Uh-huh. So the question is that, you know, uh, Overfitting. For a particular item I, uh, Maybe the mentions for a particular site are more uh, based on what other site mentioned later on. So shouldn't you take into account like what the ordering of yeah, that particular item was? Uh, that's a good point. So the so the question was what what happens if information gets old or if you know sort of order of sites is also important. So what I'm showing here is the basic version of the model. Um, you can add this actually in the paper. That sort of there are these extensions that also try to account for how old was information and things like that. Here it's sort of the most basic, the essence of the model, but you can very easily add those sort of penalty terms to it. So it's a good point. Okay. So here is here is the setting, and I'll show you how well this works. So the point is the following. I will take top 1,000 one uh, quotes uh, by, by total number of mentions. And uh, these 1,000 quotes, um, uh, in this case, got mentioned uh, 372,000 times across a set of uh, 16,000 websites. And now what I want to do is the following. I want to predict what is the future number of mentions of a particular quote based by only mo uh, monitoring 100 highest volume websites, right? So the idea is I want to learn 100 influence functions to predict what will be going on at the, uh, over a population of 16,000 different websites, right? So I'm monitoring a small set of the media space and I'm trying to make a prediction about what's going on over 16,000. Uh, media sites big space, right? And the way I will, what I will compare against here is uh, standard um, time series uh, regression models like ARMA uh, and um, autoregression and so on, right? And um, the, 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 my baseline will be, will be the um, just sort of in the future predict whatever is happening at the present, right? Sort of what I call one, one time lag predictor. And um, what is the point? The point is that time series prediction gives you around seven to 8% improvement over, um, over, uh, over this baseline, while this influence model with only 100 influence functions gives you between uh, six and 20% improvement over the, over the baseline. Um, and the other important point is that it works particularly well for bursty phrases, sort of for cases where you have a quick spike and then a decay versus something that is slower and smoother, of course, um, time series regression will do, will do well. So the point is you get very reasonable results even in this setting where you only uh, observe uh, when 100 websites mentioned the quote and you'd like to predict what will happen across the population of 16,000 websites. Um, so this is, this is the first thing. The second interesting thing that you can gain from this is to say that um, you can start analyzing influence functions, right? So you can start to say, okay, so wh what, do they, what kind of insights do they give me, right? So for example, you can now start uh, estimating influence functions not across the whole population of, of phrases, but on, you can do this per topic, right? So you could say, aha, uh -huh, if New York Times writes, writes a post on politics, how many other people tend to mention it next day, right? And this kind of question is, 
answered exactly by the influence functions. So what I will do now is I will do the following. I will, I will learn influence functions for five different media sites. So newspapers, professional blogs, TV stations, news agencies, and usual blogs. And I will do this separately for each of the six topics that I have here. So like politics, nation, entertainment, business, technology, and sports. These are basically sections of the newspaper. And um, now I want to, for all phrases on a particular topic, I want to estimate the average influence function of a particular media type. And here, is, here are some, some, some examples of these things, right? So this is now time, and this is, um, this is the, the influence, the number of mentions, and each curve corresponds to a different media site. Here I want to compare uh, news agencies versus personal blogs. Um, this is uh, a topic for politics. These are entertainment stories. And you can see, for example, differences that in politics, it is actually, it is news agencies that, that are the most influential at the beginning. So whenever sort of a news agency mesh, mentions something on politics, it, tend to, it tends to appear on many other websites uh, very soon. But then uh, very quickly this influence drops. While for example, if I now ask about enter entertainment stories um, or phrases that appear in entertainment sections, some of them um, actually, most of the influence goes from, from the blogosphere, and also their influence is more stable or sort of more long-lived over time, right? So again, um, uh, news agencies tend to decrease relatively quickly, while blog blogs tend to be like these echo chambers and keep discussions alive uh, longer. So one of the sort of things that come from this is that, that um, that blogs are the places where actually discussion is going on and if you want some, your piece of information to be long lived, you want to get it into the blogosphere sort of as quickly as possible. Um, so this now was some kind of global, was global prediction about the influence of, um, of, um, um, of how popular a particular piece of information will be. What I want to do next is sort of tackle the next question that many times becomes important. So what I would really like to do is, understand what are the underlying networks over which the information spreads. So the idea is the following, right? So before I was showing you this picture and I was telling you that we can trace when different websites mention the information. The problem really is that all I get to see if I don't have hyperlinks is when the sites mention the information but I don't get to, to see the sort of the direction of the flow. So what I would like to, to, to basically do is that I only get to see the times when people mention information, but I would like to reconstruct what was the underlying diffusion network, so the network over which the information spread. Okay, so here is uh, more, more formally what, uh, what the setting is, right? So I have some network over which information spreads, but I don't see this network. I only see the nodes of the network, no edges. And then I, I get to see the times when nodes adopt or mention the information, when they get infected, right? So I say, aha, uh -huh, there is a yellow piece of information that first appeared at A, and then appeared at C, and then at B, and then at E, right? And this is the trace I get. All I get is identities and times when information appeared at the nodes, and then I go get a next piece of information, maybe the blue one, and I see that it's spread in a different way, and again, all I get to see is the identities and the times when the nodes got infected. So what do I want to do is I want to figure out what is the underlying network that best explains how, that best explains how information was spreading over it, right? So I want to infer this network. So there are many other applications where the same thing sort of happens. So if I, if I have diseases, then I can say, aha, uh -huh, I have a social network over which a disease propagates. I don't get to see um, who, who infected whom. I only get to see when people get sick. Can I, based on the correlations in infection times, figure out what is the time when people, uh, what is the underlying network that um, may, uh, over which the disease propagated? Or another application that we actually had some data and we looked at was if I have recommendations that propagate, product recommendations that propagate between people, the, um, I only get to see when people buy products, but I don't get to see who made the recommendation to whom. H can I figure out what is the underlying network over which these recommendations were spreading? Okay, so again, in all these questions, in, all, in both these cases, the question is what is the underlying network? So what I want to do ne next is the following, right? So I want to show you a principled method how to do these kinds of inferences. And the reason why you would want to do this, infer this kind of networks, because this allows you to then gain insight and say, uh -huh, what is the role a particular node, a particular, let's say, media site plays in the information diffusion, right? Is somebody more like a summarizer that uh, summarizes the content? Or is someone more like who's like a hub and people tend to cite, uh, get the information from him and so on? Okay, so that's the idea. And the way we will do this, infer these networks is that we will 
put everything in the maximum likelihood framework, right? So our idea will be the following. We will say, okay, we have a set of, C is a set of uh, node infection times, cascades, right? And we will say, okay, if you give me a graph, I want to tell you how likely were, were these infection times uh, to happen on, on the top of this graph. And if I'm able to, to estimate this expression here, then in some sense I could search over all possible graphs and find the most likely one and show you that one and say, hey, here is my graph. Okay, so that's generally the idea. The way we will go about this is the following. So the first thing we will need to define is how likely is node U to infect node V, right? So we will say, uh -huh, I have a particular cascade, a particular piece of information C, how likely was that node U transfer this piece of information to node V? Okay, so that's the first sort of um, um, uh, expression that we will need to define. And this will be basically, we will need to define a model of how information diffuses through the network. Once we will have that, we will say, aha, uh -huh, so now if I know how likely was U to transmit information to V or how likely was U to infect V, the question will be, okay, how likely is, is, the, is the whole information to spread in now in a particular cascade or a, a pattern T? So that will be sort of the next expression we'll have to estimate. And then the last, the last one we will, we will have to estimate or be able to compute will be, aha, uh -huh, so now I'm given a graph. How likely was this, set, was, set, was this set of infections to occur in the graph? And um, because I have now multiple infections in the graph at the same time, also what is the probability of all these or likelihood of all these infections in the graph? Uh, here I have a little typo. Okay, so uh, of course, what will be the problem? The first problem will be, how do I estimate the likelihood? So how, how do I estimate the probability of cascades given the graph? And then the second thing will be, if I can estimate this expression, how do I efficiently find the graph that maximizes that expression, right? Sort of how do I efficiently search over all these graphs? Um, so that will be, that will be the, the outline of what we are trying to do, okay? So I will start at the beginning and we'll start talking about, okay, how, how can we model how information diffuses through the network? So the way we will do this is the following. We will say, aha, uh -huh, we have a single cascade, a single piece of information, and this piece of information wants to spread through the network. Now we are assuming we know the network. So the way we will think about this is the following. We will have like a two-step model. So at the first, a node gets infected. Let's say A mentions the information, and now, now information can spread to C. It will spread to some other node with probability beta. So there will be this coin flip. And then after, if the information decides to transmit, then we will also sample what we will call incubation time, right? So, right? so some time of how long did it take for that information to transmit? So the way we will say, we will say, we will think about this is the following. So if I have two nodes, U and V, and they both mentioned um, the same piece of content, then I will say the probability that it transmitted from U to V is, is in some sense, let's say, proportional to the, to, the dis, to the distance in time that both sides mentioned the piece of information. So I can say the longer the time, the, the difference in time, the less likely was the information to spread from U to V. Um, and that's the basically the basic piece of intuition. So the intuition will be the more closely we tend to mention the information, the more likely were you to influence me, okay? And here, of course, you can have much more complicated expressions, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing now is given a set of infection times and let's say that I have now this cascade uh, that, that infected node A at time one, C at time two, B at time three, and E at time four. And let's assume that I know that it went from A to B, from A to C, and from B to E. So the way now, what I need to now to estimate is um, what's the probability that, that um, this kind of e event occurred, right? What's the probability that this cascade, this set of infection times happened in a pattern like this? And I'm still assuming I have the graph. So the way I do this is basically saying, aha, uh -huh, I started at A, then my infection propagated to um, C and B. Uh, when it came to C, it didn't propagate to B because it came from A. So really what I need to do is to say, aha, uh -huh, here is the set of edges over which the information propagated, right? These are sort of the blue edges, and this is the set of edges where the information did not propagate, right? Sort of this is the positive evidence. The, the positive evidence is each propagation occurred with probability beta, and then there is this time lag between the infections that I have here, and then if the information didn't propagate, that's a, that's a, that's a factor of one minus beta, right? That happens with probability one minus beta. And what we will do is, um, in, the, in the model, we will go and ignore this, fa this, fa uh, this last factor. So we will say that probability that a particular cascade propagated in a particular pattern T, a particular tree pattern, is simply the product of over the edges of this tree uh, and the infection times here. Okay, so that's the, that's the first uh, piece. 
The, the second question is, um, is really how likely is the information not to spread in a particular pattern, but over the graph, right? And because we don't know how the information spread, there may be different ways that are of, of, the, of how, the, how our contagion could have spread that are all consistent with my infection times. Right, so here I'm showing like three different trees that are all consistent with this, right? In all the trees, A gets infected first, C gets infected second, and B gets infected third. And for B, it's not clear whether it got infected from A or whether it got inf infected um, uh, from, uh, from C, as I show here, right? So really, if I would want to compute now the probability of a particular set of infection times over the graph, I would need to sum over all over all the, all the trees that could, over all the ways that this information could have spread through the graph. And again, um, that is infeasible to do. So what I, I will do here is I will just take the most likely tree, right? So instead of going here and saying, uh, let's sum over all the trees, I will only sum over, uh, I will only consider the most likely tree. So the most likely way how the information could have spread over the graph. So now, now I told you how to, how to compute uh, how likely is a particular set of infection times to occur on a particular graph G, okay? So now, because I have multiple infections, I will assume they are independent, so I will, um, I will multiply them together. So now I, I have this, um, I will take the logarithms, so this is now the likelihood, this is now the log likelihood. So what I really want to do is I want to optimize this expression, right? I want to find the graph that, th that best explains how information spread over this graph. All right, um, that's, that's basically my goal. My goal is to find a graph on K edges such that um, it is the most, sort of it is the best explanation for the observed infection times of multiple information propagation events. I have a question. Yeah. So, so basically I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the assumption of this independence, right? So you're assuming that basically, you know, each look actually propagate to the, to the child independently? independently? No, well, independence means that um, diffusion of um, one, one information is independent of diffusion of another piece of information, right? So this is what here, little c is a particular contagion, particular item, a particular hashtag on Twitter, let's say. And now I say that diffusion of one hashtag is independent of the other hashtag. Right, but, but, but let's say we have two, two parents. Let's say in the examples, right? A, uh -huh. a actually spread to B, and then possibly B or A can actually spread to C. Uh -huh. but, but you only have one parent, right? You only be affected, affected by one parent. Exactly. So the way so the way I model the process here is I model it like a disease. You get infected by one node, right? Even though you have five, I don't know, five infected neighbors, at the end one is that infects you. Right? So even though each of them gets a chance to do that. So each of them gets a chance to do that, but the first one who infects you, that's the one who who really transmitted. Okay? Good. So this is sort of what we want to do, right? We want to find the graph that best explains uh, our data. Um, the problem, sort of the, 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 the issue here is that if you want to do this exactly, it's MP hard. Um, but I'll show, you, I'll show you sort of a nice, nice result that means that we can s still solve this approximately in, um, in polynomial time. So here is, here's the fact. So the fact is that this objective function, this log likelihood f of, of a particular graph is monotonic and submodular, and submodular in edges of G. So what do I mean by that is that if I have two graphs and um, they have the same node set but the different edge, uh, dif different edge sets. So A has sort of a subset of edges of B, right? Then the submodularity property says that the, the, the score of the graph um, that is smaller and I add a particular edge to it, the improvement of, that, of the score of that graph will be bigger than if I add that same edge to a, to a super superset uh, to a graph that has more edges than A, right? So A has fewer edges than B. Now I'm considering adding a particular edge to the, to the, gra to the graph. If I add this edge to, uh, to a small graph, it will help me more. It will increase my quality of the graph more than if I add the same edge to A, to a that edges, right? So uh, this is the property called submodularity. Um, the way, for example, one of the classical submodular optimization problems is set cover, right? So the idea is if I already covered some space and now I want to cover, um, add another, uh, another set to cover more of it, the, f the less I covered before, the more that set will help me. Um, and the point is that if I have, um, um, if I have uh, uh, optimization functions that have this particular kind of structure, then I can use greedy hill climbing, hill climbing algorithm to optimize these functions. And there are two, two good things that happen. 
The first thing that happens is that I have an approximation guarantee. I know that um, I won't be too far off from the optimal solution. And the other thing is sometimes I also have very good estimates how far at most I am from the optimal solution. So in uh, the way the algorithm will, will work is very simple. So I will use this greedy hill climbing to optimize my objective function, my score of G. I will start with an empty graph, so a graph with only nodes but no edges. And then I will add k edges one after the other. And at every step, I will add the edge that increases the score of the graph the most, right? So this is, so at time i, at step i, I will take whatever graph I have right now, I will add and I will search over all the edges that I haven't yet added, and I will see which edge increases the value of my objective function, the score of my graph the most, and I will add in that, that edge, right? So what I'm really doing is I'm just saying, I have some current graph, which is the best edge I can put in into my graph right now? And I add that edge, and then again I say, okay, which is the next best edge that I could add in my graph right now? And if I do keep doing this, basically the point is that now in quadratic time I can, I can, infer, I can infer the underlying network. So let me show you how well, how well this works. So um, the first set of experiments uh, we did was on synthetic data. So the idea here was I want to take a graph on k edges. I simulate how information diffuses through it. I only record node infection times. And now I want to reconstruct the graph based on these node infection times. And I can measure now precision in the recall of the edges um, of, of the graph. And what I have here, for example, is this is um, recall, that's precision. Um, if I'm uh, as close to this uh, point of 1, 1, that's best. And you can see that in this case, we were basically able to exactly reconstruct the graph. And here is some other case, a different graph. Again, um, we were very, very, very close to, to nearly exactly reconstructing the graph. Right? So the idea is that sort of our break-even point, so the point where precision equals recall, is around point, point 0.95. And it seems that performance is independent of the structure of, of G. So uh, the underlying graph can sort of have any kind of we are still able to reconstruct it. So let me now show you some results on the real data. So the real data, again, I was using, I'm using the meme, the, the meme tracking spinner quotes data. I have 172 million news articles and blog posts over a period of uh, one year in this case. I have um, 300 uh, million uh, quotes. And for each, for each uh, quote, I record times when different media sites mentioned that quote. And what I would like to do now is I would like to say, aha, uh -huh, just based on when the times when nodes mention the information, can I infer the underlying diffusion network? And um, basically, this, the interpretation of this network would be who tends to copy from whom, or who, who tends to repeat the information after whom. And um, here is a nice messy picture. So this is now um, an, a graph on 5,000 nodes where blue, blue nodes are blogs and red nodes are mainstream media sites. And um, if you sort of analyze this network, you see that it has a core periphery structure. But what is interesting is that when you zoom in, um, these kinds of structures tend to emerge. So this is a, sort of the same network as there. We are just zooming in into a particular part. And the first thing here is that you find this kind of nice clusters between sites, right? So each site here is um, a, a, blo a, a media site. Uh, again, red is mainstream media, blue is blogs. Um, the URLs denote what the, what the sites are, and the edges correspond to what, what do we think is the underlying network over which the information is spreading. And you see here, for example, nice political, sort of political blogosphere cluster. This is, uh, then you, f you see this uh, community of, um, of uh, entertainment uh, websites and a community of technological websites. Right, um, and what is interesting now is to observe um, what are the what are the positions or locations of different nodes in these networks. For example, Huffington Post, which is like a liberal online newspaper or blog, is here heavily embedded in the in the political cluster. Right, but then, for example, if you take this Guardian, which is a newspaper in UK, um, it's it also sort of is close or is connected to, to the entertainment part of the world and to the, to the, um, to the technology-oriented blogs, right? And here are my technology-oriented blogs. Some are more embedded in the network. Some also have connections to elsewhere. Um, Salon.com, another um, website, is, uh, is a sort of a, a popular online media site, um, is down there and so on, right? So what is interesting now is that based on the times when sites mention information, I can infer these networks and I can start reasoning about what are positions of the nodes in these networks and what kind of roles do they play in information diffusion. 
Um, so this is, this, is, um, this is the way to infer networks. And really, why would we want to infer networks is, um, is the following thing, right? So if now I have the network and I can trace how information flows, um, then I can start saying which blogs, which media sites should I recommend you to read so that you are most up to date, right? So the idea is the following. I have the yellow story that spreads in a particular way. I have the red story that spreads in a particular way. Here is maybe the blue piece of information that spreads. And now I want to, I want to make you recommendations so that you know uh, stories before everyone else does. Right, so imagine if I would recommend you the, the particular block uh, down there, the, um, uh, the, the good point would be that you would know about all three stories, you would learn about all of them, but you would learn about them very late, right? While on the other hand, if somehow would say you should read the machine learning theory blog, right, then you will know about everything first, right? Or the, the imp you will know about important things first, but you will miss the red story, right? And, um, because I'm running out of time, I won't go through details how you can do this. But the way, the way you can think about this is really um, think about this as some kind of, you want to cover the blogosphere so that all the all, nearly all the stories are covered. And um, there will be um, um, two, parts, two, two parts to the problem. So the first part will be what is the cost of, let's say, monitoring or reading a blog, right? So the blog that has, has more, more posts is, has more time to read, uh, takes more time to read. So I will think about this. I will say I have a network. Each node is, let's say, a blog or a media site. I will put some cost on each, blo on each blog, uh, sort of how much time it takes me to read that thing. And then I will also uh, have some kind of reward structure. So what I mean by that is um, that I want to sort of minimize that people, the, the number of people that, that know the story before I know the story, right? So the idea is if there is some story that spreads through the blogosphere, I would like to catch this story as quickly as possible. Sort of the, 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 the quality of the recommendation is proportional to the number of people that know about the story or mention the story after I get to hear about it, right? And in some sense, we would like to detect this kind of information outbreaks as quickly as possible. Um, without going into details how this works, I will just say the following thing. That um, the, way you, the way the algorithm works is basically it, it thinks about, about the blogosphere as sort of covering blogs, um, covering the blogosphere with a set of blogs so that you detect information from, uh, from all, all of the sites. So the idea is that each sort of each blog has a, has a set of uh, a circle of influence. And now I want to cover the, the graph with this some kind of um, influence sets. Um, and uh, here is an example um, of, of, of real data where uh, dots represent blogs, size of the dot represents how big is the blog, and the way algorithm works, it works in sequence and it sort of picks the first blog and it says, uh -huh, now this is the best, the, sort of the best news source for you to follow, um, and you will sort of get to know pretty much about everything, but you will get to know about this very late. So then the algorithm picks the, the blog number two, and now sort of stories that appear in this part of the, of the graph are covered by, by this blog. And then, for example, here is number three, and now everything that changed the color sort of is detected by, by my website number three. And then here was number four, and this is sort of what number four covers and so on, right? So in this, um, in this way, you sort of slowly cover the, the graph with a set of uh, blogs or new sites to monitor. And just to show you how well this works, so here is, for example, number of blogs you read, and this is fraction of stories that you detect, so amount of information, important information that you get. Um, if you would pick, if you would read nodes that blogs that trend a random set of blogs, this is your score. Um, if you would uh, read big blogs, that would be, be your score. If you would read blogs that create most of the outlinks, it's about the same as reading big blogs. This is get, reading blogs that get cited the most, and this is what you get from, from this optimization. So really, what is the point that I want to make is, because we were able to identify the network, now I can start reasoning about how information spreads over it, and I can start making recommendations about maybe which news sites should you follow to detect these big information outbreaks as quickly as possible. I didn't go into details of the algorithm, but at the end, it's some kind of greedy, greedy selection algorithm, uh, submodular optimization. Um, there is paper and links uh, on the tutorial website. So let me conclude in the next minute and a half, and then we'll have a break. So sort of what, what was the first part of the tutorial about was how do we reason about messages that are arriving through networks from real-time sources, 
and what kind of um, what kind of dynamics does this create? Right? We were talking about tracking information through networks, uh, quantify the dynamics of online media, predict the diffusion of this net of this information, and infer um, n underlying networks over which information diffuses, so that we can then, for example, do recommendation for what new sites to read or detect outbreaks, uh, find most influential websites, and so on. Um, so I, what, I think what are interesting topics that I sort of just touched upon but, um, but haven't been explored is, for example, I was explaining at the beginning about sentiment, right? So, so how, how could we, for example, identify dynamics of polarization, right? So um, how, you know, how does the attitude and sentiment change as the information spreads through the parts of the network and how could we control, uh, uh, control that? So that, um, I think, is a sort of a set of uh, an interesting um, area for future work. Um, what I have is uh, links to different articles that I mentioned and discussed in the, in the, in the first part of the tutorial. As I said, um, slides are available online at this particular URL. Uh, we will have a break now, and uh, we will start in half an hour, and we will uh, reason about um, social networks and things like that. Thanks.